everyone, and uh, thanks for coming down to um, sunny Geelong. So what I'd like to just touch on is um, the difference between machine learning and, and AI, and, and these terms are being used um, you know, interchangeably, and what I'd like to do is just say machine learning is about the process of training, and, and we train computers to learn information, and then we take that application, and AI is the application of that um, of the learning that's happened um, in with the machine. So, one of the things that we've we've come up with is this Toffee framework. The Toffee framework is all about how do we break things up, and Toffee is is a framework that we've created to to give us a bit of an insight and the the four general application areas of artificial intelligence. And the first thing we want to do is target the particular information that the machine has learnt. So we need to target specific insights. The, the second thing is we need to optimise. So we need to make sure that the information that we're getting, that we've learnt, is being optimised for the application that we're, we're trying to, to deliver on. The, the, the third thing is, 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 the is the forecast. Now, you know that our friends at the Bureau of Meteorology um, give us forecasts. Today it's going to rain and you look outside, yep, it's raining. Um, but they use a number of different forecasting methods and, and, and they use a number of different um, algorithms to, to do that. And, and forecasting is very important because we can then forecast and give the human, and I, and I stress the word human, and you'll hear the human come out a little bit later on as well, the human, um, the appropriate information. And of course, um, the, last, the last thing we want to do is, is provide insights. And that's very, very important because we, for everything that we try and learn, there'll be an insight associated with that. Um, about five, six years ago, I, I had gone to a conference uh, in, in San Francisco with a colleague uh, and my deputy director, Raj Vaza. And on the way home um, from LA to Melbourne, I couldn't sleep, which is typical of you know, me being on a plane. Um, so I woke him up and said, wake up, stop sleeping. Um, we've got work to do. And he said, what are you talking about? Leave me alone. I said, no, 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 we've got work to do. I, I, we, I've been thinking about this. And we, we had seen some technology um, in, in, uh, with Samsung in San Francisco, and I thought, there's no way any, any, anyone can use this if we don't make it simpler and easier to use. And so we came back and we created this thing called Sophie Hub, which is a set of sensors that don't intrude and don't, we don't have to wear anything. You don't have to put anything around your neck because, you know, the elderly think that they're wearing a cowbell. Um, that's what their mates tell them. You know, you're wearing this cowbell around your neck, you know, the button that tells them that, you know, where I'm in trouble. And, of course, their friends tell them that they're old. Yet the person who's telling them that they're old are older than the person that they're telling that they're old. And so we did some research and put all this together and we created this entity called... Um, and span, uh, it's been spun out of the, the university called Sophie Hub. Um, it's, uh, it's a technology which gives, gives medication reminders to, to those living um, on their own. Um, gives them uh, reminders about uh, making sure that they um, hydrate because they haven't had anything to, to drink. Because we, we have sensors that have both movement, humidity, temperature and so on, all in the one sensor. And of course it gives them greetings. Good morning Con, today is Wednesday and you're going to Geelong and the temperature will be 18 degrees. And don't forget, it's Vetter's birthday, no, no it's not really, but it's Vetter's birthday and make sure you ring her and say happy birthday to her. Um, and so they get this feeling of comfort associated with that. And if they spend too much time in the bathroom, then we have an alert system that sort of asks them to move out of the bathroom back into where we can actually sense that they're back into another room. And if they don't, then we have an escalation process. This system is now in homes. It was trialled for the first time and the second time in the greater city of Geelong, and the third trial was with participants from the TAC, those who had acquired brain injury. Interestingly enough, for those who had acquired brain injury, we put the system in, it was there for six weeks, we said, okay, well, we're all done now, the, 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 the study's finished, and they said, uh, uh, no, we need this, it's not going anywhere, you're not taking it away from us. So we had to then negotiate with the TAC to keep the system running for them, because it gave them a, a reminder coming into the home put the keys on, on, on the hook, it's 12 o'clock, you need to have some lunch, how about you make yourself a toast, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon and you usually take your medication, we've noticed you haven't taken, you haven't opened the cupboard to take your medication, etc, etc. It gives them more independence, those who, and, and of course those, the, 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 these people have suffered acquired brain injury through a, a motor vehicle accident. So 
we're using anomalous behaviour to trigger these events. And guess what? The human is the most important part of this whole thing. Um, airport security. My friends at, in the lab kept on using me as the scapegoat and saying, Con's worried about flying, therefore we've got to make sure that you know, if there's an, any sort of uh, anomalous behaviour um, outside the airport, before they even go through the check-ins, that we can pick that up. I was scared about, you know, things that were happening overseas in Constantinople or Istanbul, um, and people blowing themselves up before they even got to, you know, the check-in counter. And so we, we use some technology, some facial recognition. We need five seconds of video, and we can then work out if someone's heart rate is elevated or not. We're not intruding, we just take the video and we can do it very simply. It's plus or minus 10 um, if we use a, a monitoring device. So all we're looking for is a very high um, uh, heart rate or something we call normal. And our friends in Homeland Security and so on are very interested in this now because we want to protect our, our borders. One of the other things that uh, we've been working on is this facial recognition and it has some, some very interesting applications. And it, not here in Australia, but overseas. So we've trialled it in India, of all places, because there seems to be a discrepancy between individuals who might be saying that they are the person who's sitting the exam and they are the same person who's doing the fitness exam and they're the same person who's doing the oral exam, et cetera, et cetera. And we had 10,000 people go through um, a particular test, that is, those who wanted to become police officers in a particular state, and they go through four different stages. We picked up 73 people that were not the right people who said they were. So that's the evidence. That's, it happened. We did the analysis and we got the feedback and it only came back last week, but that's what it's all about. And, and it's there. It's, we're using the machine, but the human is the most important person in the loop. And, of course, it has ramifications for um, auditing purposes for building sites, if it's the right person to go into the right building site, have the, did, they have the right, uh, did they have the authority to do so and so on and so forth. The thing that is most important and we're very, very proud of is the, the work that we've done with the Alfred Hospital. The Alfred Hospital, of course, as you know, is the largest trauma hospital in the Southern Hemisphere. It takes 90% of all the trauma in the state of Victoria. 90% goes to the Alfred, 10% goes to the Royal Melbourne and, of course, all the, all the children's stuff goes to the kids hospital. <clears throat> About 12 years ago, Professor Fitzgerald, who was the Director of Trauma, and still is the Director of Trauma, came to me and said, we need a system to help us improve our outcomes. And so we built a decision support system. It was trialled over 33 months. We had two trauma bays with the technology, two trauma bays without the technology. And after the evaluation, it was found that we, we, we improved the errors of omission. So we, were, we knew where they made the mistakes and we, improved, and, and we were able to reduce the errors of omission by 21%, which translates to about five or six lives a year that we save by just making sure that we pick up on the errors of omission, the things that they forget to do. They can do them very, very well, but they have to make a decision every 72 seconds when a trauma patient arrives at the trauma centre. That's every 72 seconds, I've got to make a decision, I've got to make sure that I'm keeping these people alive. One of the other things that, uh, that happened because of this was that we reduced the amount of blood that was being administered in the first 30 minutes by 30%. And of course, there was significant time reduced in ICU. On average, they were spending about 114 hours in ICU. They're now down to about 88 hours with better outcomes through the trauma ward and then, of course, getting home, which is most important. The human is the most important part of all this. We're trying to save the human life. We're using decision support, a bit of AI, a bit of machine learning to make sure that this all happens. Funny enough, we've implemented this in India at the largest trauma hospital in New Delhi, um, southern China, and, of course, in, um, uh, in Riyadh and, and King Saud Medical um, City in, um, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In India, we improve their outcomes by a staggering 70% because we force them to do the things that they should be doing. Fantastic. So it's going to be implemented there. And, of course, we're now going through the next phase of what we're going to do and, and we're going to look at heart attacks and so on and so forth. So that's, that was a discussion that I had yesterday with Mark at the, at the Alfred Hospital. 
We're also working with our friends at both the Royal Melbourne and the Alfred on predicting epileptic fits. The patients come in, they spend a whole week in, in, the, um, in, the, in the hospital and they have to wear this thing over their head, it's got 32 sensors, they wear things on their arms and so on and so on. So we collect a, a significant amount of data. What we're trying to do is work out what the markers are that we can use if they wear a, a particular um, handheld device that might be able to sort of pick up and make sure that that will also have impact on them um, having an epileptic fit. Can we give them some, some guidance? You're going to have an epileptic fit and they can stop the car, sit down, be comfortable, secure, and then have that epileptic fit. If we can give it to them five seconds before it happens, we'll be really, really happy. How far away are we? A long way away. But we're using machine learning and all of the things that that machine learning and the pattern recognition that, that Zveta does very, very well so that we can start using those markers so we can build a device to allow them to know that they're going to have an epileptic fit. So AI can power intelligent assistance. AI is very powerful. AI is also very stupid. The only thing that we need to remember is that we are um, creating the human in the loop AI. We're not getting rid of the human. We're not removing the human. We're not uh, getting rid of jobs. We're just going to make the human a little bit more efficient. And of course, in, in, our, in, in today's world with productivity and so on, we just need to use AI to allow them to be a little bit more efficient. The human is not being removed in any way, shape or form. It's very important to realise that we, we hear a lot of people saying, that, you know, here, goes, here, here go the humans, we're not going to have any jobs in Victoria, we're not going to have this and that, no. We are the new age, there'll be more jobs, AI will enhance our productivity and will enhance the way the human makes those decisions in a more intelligent way. Engaging with, with us is, is very important. You've seen a number of examples where we've got industry, we've created some industry, we're working with our industry partners and we would love to um, have you working with us. Zveta does all the hard work, I do the implementation. And, um, and uh, my background is software engineering, so we, we need the software engineers to build these systems which will allow you to, to take advantage of the, the, the work that Zveta does. So thank you again.